Good, good. Did you get enough sleep? I didn't. <laughs> my uh, daughter uh, and I started a snow cave before Christmas because we figured with all that snow, what the hey. And it's a lot of work, so, but I saw we were going to have a, a fairly long streak. I didn't think it would be this long, so it's, it's worked out really well. We just, my wife doesn't enjoy shoveling the driveway always to the same side, but the mound's pretty good now. It's taller than us. Uh, inside, let's see, it's uh, the longest direction. It's more than 10 feet long inside it. Uh, at the highest point, she could stand up. My daughter's like five foot, five one. So it's generally been around five feet. Anyway, we've been having fun. I just, with the warmer weather though, it's all started sagging inside. You know, instead of being like this, nice and curved arch, it kind of drooped. So I spent longer shoveling it out. That's what I did. I exerted lots of energy. I did lots of work. That's what today's topic's on. And no, I didn't plan that. That's just my lame transition. So, um, Before I uh, start with a, a demonstration, I would like to share with the class so that you guys can continue to decide what you want. Um, today will be chapter 7 on energy. At the end, about machines and energy with them. Wednesday will be more of that. Friday will be chapter 10, projectile motion. Just projectile motion. When it starts talking about satellites, I'm not testing you on that. Uh, we'll be done then, by the end of this week, with chapter 6, 7, and 10. So next week, we'll have a test on what was it, Wednesday. We'll review on Monday before we start uh, different topics. I don't want to, you know, smaller bits. Maybe you can remember this <laughs> better. That was my thought. Also, I've been looking, and I'm pleased to say that uh, exam one, when you guys took it in class, the average was a C. Uh, what was it, like 72% or something? I don't know. With the retake, those of you that were able to take the retake and getting a better grade and averaging, it brought the class up 15 percentage points, the average. So that means you did much better than that, and we averaged it to those of you that took it. So good, good. However, um, I also looked to see which of you have viewed any of the answer keys from any past assignments, including exam one. Exam one, for example, only two of you have even bothered to look at the answers yet. So I know you're busy, but I would think you would at least want to know what the correct answers were. As for the other homeworks, uh, at most, it's like around nine people. You know, there's roughly 70 people in the class. So thus, getting to you. Um, I encourage you to do that. I don't know why you're not, because you're not learning that stuff, understanding what, what you did wrong in the first place, maybe, so that you would get, do better on the test. Or now that we've had the test, maybe you think you have to forget about it. Well, it's your choice. We will have a final, so you might want to know what you did. Yeah? Well, after it's due, if you pull up the assignment again, then there's a big thing that says, warning, uh, view key. Realize if you view the key, you may be blah, blah, blah. In other words, if any of you go to ask me or plead me for something extra and I've seen you've already viewed the key, you're out of luck. But uh, while I'm on that, I also realized this weekend when you're looking at your grades, I told you in WebAssign you could go at the top under grades and look at anything under your raw scores. I didn't realize because I'm never on the student side as much. You can just click on my assignments, which is right up there next to grades, and it'll show all your assignments with your individual scores. Oh, that's another way. But yes, if you go back to those assignments and, and view them after the due date, then you have the option to view the key. And most of the questions I try to put a, um, 
a brief explanation of why the correct answer is what it is. So, a resource that many of you aren't taking advantage of, and I encourage you to do so. <laughs> you guys have any uh, questions before we delve into topics? <laughs> Glad I could help. <laughs> So she had a device, she was pulling up WebAssign, couldn't find that. Uh, there it was. Okay. Good. Yeah, if you got problems, email me. Many of you have, thank you. Okay. Momentum. That's what we studied last time. Defined by P and it's mass times velocity. It's our equation, our guide to thinking. Inertia in motion. Uh, some people refer to momentum as oomph. Since there's several non-English speakers, you know, oomph. Uh, it's kind of like when you know something's moving along, and based on how big it is, the bigger it is, the more inertia it has the more resistance to change it will have. Thus, if it runs into you, it'll hurt more. <laughs> because it will take more force to stop it, won't it? So we say that has more momentum. And the other side of that coin is the faster it comes at you, the more momentum it has. It's the product of those two. Don't forget, both are involved. And with that example, when it runs into you, let's say, there's a change in momentum. And what's another term for that? I heard impulse and acceleration. Impulse. Before, when we had uh, a force, that causes a mass to, to change its motion and accelerate. So you apply a force, you get an acceleration. I'll be more technical, a net force. You get the thing to accelerate. It's some net acceleration. Because we've you know, encountered many times now, you can have two forces on something, and they're both trying to accelerate it due to their own individual forces, but together they might not be accelerating the object in the net effect. So apply a force, you get an acceleration. Apply an impulse, you get a change in momentum. Just rewrite it again. Change in momentum. And an impulse is a force, put it up here, but with time. We consider how long that uh, impact or collision occurs. Thus, for the same change in momentum, make sure I say it right this time, we'll go back to our uh, egg in a sheet in the wall, or airbag in a car in the dashboard, or we had a car running into a wall or a haystack. If something's moving along and something causes it to stop, that's a change in momentum, because the velocity changes. And if it's coming in at a certain speed and stops, it's going to have the same change in momentum, no matter what stops it, correct? No matter what stops it, it should have the same change in momentum, same impulse. However, how quickly you stop it will affect the forces between the two objects. You do it quickly, whoosh, small t then you're going to have a big F for the same impulse, and vice versa. And again, because I love it, this all builds, the egg and the sheet versus the egg and the wall, the forces between the egg and the sheet are the same, but they're less than when they hit the wall, because the wall can exert a bigger force on the egg than the sheet can. 
And all that then led to a conservation of momentum. So we did several collisions. And if you look at all the objects, momentums before something happens, and compare it to after, they got to be equal. That's the conservation of momentum. So the total before equals the total after. Just don't forget your directions. If one's going that way and one's going that way, then one needs to be positive and one needs to be negative. Questions about that? Things that were just bugging you over the weekend. <laughs> you said the force between the egg and the wall and the egg and the key is the same, but less with the key. Isn't it just like the amount of energy that's different? Like the, I always come over here because this is where we did it. <laughs> the, uh, the egg exerts a force on the sheet. The sheet exerts a force on the egg. The egg didn't break when it hit the sheet. So those two forces were the same at some magnitude. When it hit the ground, but say we just removed the sheet, simplify it, and it ran into the wall, the egg exerts a force on the wall, the wall exerts a force on the egg, same force, but this time the egg breaks. So this force, this one or this one, is bigger than over here. And that's because the sheet can't push on the egg as, as hard as the wall can. That's like me punching the medicine ball and the coffee filter idea. The pair is the same, but one is less than the other. You sure? Yeah, it just came in at the same velocity. It does come in at the same velocity. So they both came in with the same momentum, whether they hit the sheet or the wall. So yeah, they have the same momentum. And they thus have the same change in momentum. So they have the same impulse. So we'll get over to here. But I said the sheet had less force, didn't I? And that's the key to the sheet. If it has less force, what happened to the time of collision? That's the compensating fact. It took longer for the sheet to slow it down to zero, to have the same change in momentum. Because it took longer, you didn't need as much force. You just had to do it for longer. Where the wall could do it all at once. So big force for short time. That reminds me, though, I want to emphasize, again, now you've had time to think about it, when things bounce, remember the happy sad balls? Something that bounces. It's going to come in with some momentum, and it's going to stop it. But then it turns around, keeps pushing on, on the ball, the table pushes on the ball, and shoots it back up. So, I didn't bring them, but the sad ball that just goes thud, has a certain change in momentum. The happy ball that bounces has a greater change in momentum because it stopped, turned around, and started going the other way. So if it, if it came in with, let's say, MV, positive, down, let's say, and it left with negative MV going back up, they have to be opposite signs. What's the difference? The change. You subtract the two. Uh, let's see, final, we'll do it this way. Final minus initial is 2MV. So ideally, when something bounces, it has twice the change in momentum, twice the impulse. And the collision time takes about the same amount of time. I've done studies close enough. So if they take the same amount of time, then the one that bounces will feel, ideally, twice the force. Which is why I called the ball that goes thud really is the happy ball. Because he doesn't feel as much force. Remember, if you go limp. Yes, I remember, Brian. It's hard to go limp when you're stressed out and you're, you're almost, you can tell you're going to get in a car accident. What do you do? You tense up. That's our reaction. It's tough. Uh, another instructor teaches physics of the human body, and he always has a section on collisions, uh, but bone fractures. And he shows videos and PowerPoint pictures of really funky things. Somebody faints every semester. <laughs> ankles going whoosh, but 
uh, the videos, he'll show people snowboarding, snowboarding, skiing, cycling, parkouring, wingsuiting. And sure, it's fun and everything. You know, speed doesn't kill. They all have momentum. It's, when, it's stopping <laughs> that can kill. And when you have that change in momentum provided by an impulse, a force is involved. And most people, uh, most common fractures from uh, accidents like that is because they tense up. You fall, what's the natural reaction? Put your arm out, right? Or your leg out. And if you're straight and tight, the time is small. And so both you and the ground feel a big force and your bones will break. If you can remember, instead of just bracing yourself, do that, that's fine, but don't keep it stiff. When you hit, bend a little. Roll, tuck and roll. Uh, your book gave the example. When you jump off, you know, I'd, I'd give anybody an automatic A plus right now. If you want to come up here, jump off here without bending your legs at all. Any takers? You're paying the bill, but I'll give, if you want to break your legs, I'll give you an A+. Plus. <laughs> I, you know what we do. We go and we bend. And that has the effect of increasing the time to slow me down. Thus, the force I exert on the floor and it back on me is less. And hopefully not enough to break my legs. Shock absorbers and springs work like that. Pa any padding, helmets, same effect. It doesn't seem like it increases the time much, but it's enough. And even our brains are kind of floating around in this fluid inside. There's not much room, right? But if it was completely rigid and you ran into something, then your brain is being stopped really quickly, thus feeling more forces. But I'll exaggerate, if your brain's sloshing around, your head stops, like, like the car. What do you and your brain keep doing? Inertia, keep moving a little. And so maybe the, it can slow down with a little more time. And that has a big effect. So two-dimensionally, the end of the last chapter, uh, it works as well. I don't intend to give you a problem on it, but you might as well know because you have all the tools in your toolbox that you need. We dealt with collisions in one dimension so far. You know, something comes in and it bounces straight off or vice versa. But as you well know, things don't always go in straight lines. So if I bring this one in and collide, you see, they go off at angles. I can try to hit it straight, and I probably won't ever get lucky. As we're going to get to in Chapter 10, so this is a precursor, if you got something that comes in, this one's moving, and this one's not, again, total momentum before has to equal total momentum after. If they're the same mass, then the total momentum is mv. Yeah, because this has mv, and this has none, so the total is mv. When they hit, we would just do a straight line thing, but what if it came in? And this one heads off that way, and this one heads off this way. And we got something like that. Well, when you do two-dimensional problems, all you have to do is do two one-dimensional problems. You separate it into components. This is why I exposed you to them earlier, and the author. So if uh, we take this, 
Simplify it a little. Let's just exaggerate. V1, V2. If that's the velocities they went left with, and before we started with that, this one has a certain velocity to the right. Afterwards, one's going up to the right and one's going down to the right. You just figure out, OK, what component is going in the horizontal direction? This vector we take, and if you drop a perpendicular, a straight line to an axis, here's our x-axis. Drop a line that's perpendicular. And that part is the x component, or the horizontal component, of that vector. That's the velocity causing it to go sideways. It also has one that's making it go vertically. Or, you know what I mean. Since I'm drawing it that way, we'll call it vertical. You do the same thing with the other vector. And he has one like that. And a vertical as well. And so the sum of these two vectors should be this, if I do it to scale. And you would do the same thing with the momentum. The total momentum beforehand was mv in that direction. So the total momentum in the horizontal direction would need to be mv1 in the x direction and mv2 in the x direction, those two components added together because momentum is conserved. And if this happened to, uh, oh, we can do that one. Did it, was there any vertical momentum before the collision? No, no vertical momentum. So afterwards, what's the total vertical momentum? Zero. So that means this vector and this vector would balance, because they'd, they'd, have, to, they'd have to cancel to have a sum of zero momentum. Thus, I did not draw it to scale. But that's how you'd figure out which direction things are going if it happens in more than one direction. Yes, Brian? So why are we limited to the straight lines if something goes off in a, I mean, nothing really moves in a straight line? Nothing really moves in a straight line? Can you remind me what Newton's first law is? That's not my point, but my point is that you only have the, the two discs, but they're not moving in a straight line. They're not moving in a straight line? From the collision, before the collision, one's coming straight at the other one. After the collision, they head off in di different directions, not like the original, but they're, they're straight. Until some other force acts on them, like an unlevel table or gravity, they fall off. But before the collision, or right before, you know, it's coming in with a certain momentum straight. And right after, they head, they head in straight lines. OK, OK. You'll get more of this in chapter 10, because projectile motion is you know, throwing things up. They go sideways and up and down. And so we will need to deal with two di directions. And uh, nobody's come up with a simple way to do it all at once. It's still handle one, one direction, then handle the other. Then you can combine them back together if you want. But you can't solve them at an angle diagonally all the way through, which makes our lives easier, actually, because you don't have to learn anything new. Just everything we've been telling you is still true. Just break it down so you can do it one way and then the other. Any other questions about that? OK. 
Let's put them over here. Well, good. Since we will be revisiting that in chapter 10, that was a good discussion. Okay, energy. I, I really like the uh, beginning biography of, of this chapter, if you've been reading those. Uh, Emily du Châtelet in the 1700s was one of those unsung heroes. Uh, summing it up, females weren't you know, considered to be great scientists at that time. And a lot of their work, if it was reputable, people still would dismiss because they were a female, unfortunately. Uh, however, for historical reasons, her work has come through and she's been recognized now. And she was a lot like Galileo, who was trying to figure these things out. But instead of just talking, she did experiments. She grabbed demonstrations and said, well, let's see what happens. Well, that's going to happen. You, I don't even need to do it. Um, I did it. And no, it doesn't. <laughs> I get professors that come in for their class. That's great. There's a homework problem. And the students are having trouble. And I say, Let's set this one up so I can show them it works. And my thoughts are, OK, but it's not going to work. Yeah, well, physics is true. You know, they're in, the, in theory, idealistically, yeah, it should work. But when you, in real life, you've got to worry about friction, or moments of inertia, or unlevel tables, and air resistance. And so a lot of times, there's demonstrations that don't come out exactly like the instructor is hoping. And it's just because, well, if you do it, they, there's been a few arguments, you know. <laughs> no, this will work. Just set it up. OK. And then they complain after class, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just do an experiment, and you can see that, ah, oh, yeah, real life. So that's what she did. And my terms now, how much oomph is possessed by moving objects? A lot of people, that's how, that's how I term things. How much oomph is possessed by moving objects? That was the question in her day that she tested. But it was unclear what this oomph was. And basically they were arguing, was it momentum or energy? And they didn't really define the difference. Well, oomph is this. But what they figured out was everything I told you about momentum. But with energy, it's proportional to mv squared proportional. And that was a big finding. And that leads to this whole chapter with the motion. Uh, and that's a Big difference. Realize right now, if you double the speed of something, what does that do to the momentum? Double the speed, momentum doubles. If you double the energy, uh, if you double the speed, what's it do to the energy? No. Because that 2, you know, 2v, two that 2 is squared. And what's 2 squared? 4. So if you double something's speed, you double its momentum but you quadruple its energy. If you want something to go twice as fast, you're going to have to supply four times as much energy. She realized this by dropping things in clay. You know, I like Play-Doh now. And she would measure the distance that it goes in. Kind of like Galileo measured the distance of rolling objects down on an incline. And we saw how the distance got bigger and bigger. And he really plotted that stuff out and realized that the distance was proportional to time squared. She did a similar thing and saw that the energy is proportional to velocity squared. So to see if you get this, if you triple the speed, what happens to the energy? Nine times. Three squared. So it'll be nine times as much energy, but still only three times as much momentum. So you have to keep these straight. Momentum is just v to the first power, and energy is v to the second power. The first thing in this uh, chapter is work. And for impulse, 
we exerted a force for a certain amount of, for, well, as the book puts it, you apply a force for how long? And we discuss time. Well, you can also think of applying a force for how long? Distance. That's what we call work. Just skip to it right now. Uh, work in the you know normal world, non-scientist world, uh, people think of work as as a as energy. And as a scientist, I'm here to help you think of it as a, a way that energy gets transferred. There are many different forms of energy. We're going to focus on two main ones in this chapter. Uh, but it, it can change. It's still energy. It's all the same thing. But it changes forms or from one place to another. And in order to do that, to make that change, you must apply work. Or it applies work on you. So similarly, as you apply an impulse to make a change in momentum, you're going to need to apply force over distance, work, to make a change in something's energy. Change forms or from one location to another. Does that make sense? But that's the equ equation that guides our thinking. And it means that uh, you exert some net force on something to make it move and how far it's moved. And another caveat with this is these are in the same direction. In other words, you, you know this. If I push on the wall, no. If I push on this block straight down, I'm exerting a force on it. But am I causing it to move? No. If I push on it sideways, it moves. So it would be my force times the distance I move it with that force. And that would tell me how much work I exerted on the block. Yes? So would this, would, would this apply to change of the matter? So like between like an ice cube and water. So the force of speeding up of the water molecule causes it to move a certain distance. That's a great question. Um, so does uh, this apply to uh, changes of matter? The conservation of energy does. If you want to ch change it, so its internal energy is different, then you have to apply energy or remove energy. And so energy will be conserved in that sense. Uh, you will have to uh, do work on something or let it do work, like a machine, and that will change its energy. And like ice melting, that's an internal chemical change. It's chemical energy changes, which means some work must have been done on it or vice versa. So absolutely. What if I push at an angle like this? It still moves, doesn't it? This force would only be the horizontal component if you're dealing with the horizontal distance it moved. Does that make sense? So if I'm pushing down on it with F and it moves over to here, a distance D, the work done on that to move it horizontally is not F times D. It's the component of F. Just this part, the horizontal part of it. The X component, if you will. That times D is the work done on it to move it. Because the vertical part, the parts that's pushing down, doesn't make it move down. because The table's in the way, so there's no work done on it vertically just so you realize that those need to be in the same direction now, now that we're dealing with direction. And that will change its energy. Um, units. So force is in newtons. Distance, standard unit is meters. So work is in a newton meter. <laughs> and that one does have a name, a joule. I'll write that one out, which we could just abbreviate with J. Joule is the standard unit for energy. A joule. A lot of you might be more familiar with calories, especially when you look at your food. 
that tells you the chemical energy in that, in calories. And there's a conversion between them, but they're both energy. Okay. Now, if you run up and down the stairs, um, you can change, you, you do work. You exert a force on the floor, or more importantly, the floor exerts a force on you and causes you to move up. So there's a force on you moving you. So the, the stairs do work on you. And if I come up, you know, I can get up to here. Well, how much work did I just exert? Well, you could figure out the force times the distance, and it's some value. Is the work any different from here to there if I do it like this? Why? You say no. Distance didn't change? Yeah, the force is still my weight I'm, I'm lifting up. So yeah, the work is the same. That is my point. To get to the same height, cover the same change in location. But you guys know in your gut, something's different, isn't it? Walking versus... Which is harder? I have to put harder in quotes, because what am I referring to? It, running. Doing it faster. So... We can have changes in energy work, but you can do them at different rates. You can do it slowly or quickly, similar to uh, changes in momentum. That we call power. So, oh, sorry. The speed did not have bearing on the amount of work done. But it does have bearing on something we call power. Power is the rate of, um, at which you use energy. Is a layman's way to say it. So again, a guide to thinking. If, if the t you do it more quickly with T, a small T will give more power. Do you see that? Raise something up, same amount of change in energy, same amount of work done, but you did it more quickly, so you exert more power. And those units are a joule whoop, per second, which is a, wait a minute, my... No, no, I'm right. A joule per second is a what? No, I ask you, a joule per second is a what? A what? 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 Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's always my dumb joke, sorry. <laughs> Not... What, <laughs> but what? And a lot of t that's a small unit you've probably dealt with in real life, kilowatts. A kilowatt is a thousand watts. But anyway, the rate at which you use energy. And that applies to any form of energy. If you're changing kinetic energy, work is a change in energy. So another way to think of this, Power is a change of energy per time, because it will apply to any form of energy. Do you have a question? Yeah, the, those uh, cranking flashlights. A good example of a transfer of energy. You do work by exerting a force over a distance. The distance is circular that time. But yeah, you do work. 
and that transfers energy. It, in that instance, it turns it into electrical energy. And you could turn it slowly and do the same amount of energy. It would just take longer to have the same power delivered to the light bulb. Or you can do it fast. But the emphasis there is the, how, the rate. There's a difference between work and power. That's a good example. They don't, they don't want to charge their cell phone because it takes work? They're absolutely right it takes work. How, are you going to get energy in your cell phone? It's got to come from somewhere. Conservation of energy. The total energy after has to equal the total energy before. It might be in a different form, but the total has got to stay the same. So yeah, if you want energy in your phone, you have to supply it. It's got to come from somewhere. If they're too lazy to provide the work themselves, so be it. But if they want to plug it into the wall socket and get electrical energy, well, where did we get electrical energy from? We stored it by burning coal and making steam go up to spin a fan, you know, a turbine blade. Again, force causing something to move. And we got the energy from the coal chemically, and it got the energy from the sun, you know, initially with the plants. It's all conserved. It's got to come from somewhere. You can't destroy or create energy. And you can say something has energy. Yeah. Oh. Where did energy start in the first place? Now we're getting into more metaphysics, and I don't know. But whatever amount is out there, that's what we're stuck with. You can't create more. You can't destroy it. You can change forms. You can make it a lot less useful. There are certain forms that make it less useful, like heat. But um, I'm going to say, so you can say the, this uh, bowling ball has potential. You know, it has some energy. You can say that, but you can't say it has work. It does work, or it can be worked upon. Work is that transition. Get that in your head. Uh, I even used to say when I was younger, oh, work's just a different form of energy. No, it's really the change. What causes a change Where do I do it? in the energy. So if you start thinking about that, I think it will help you. Uh, we did that, we did that, we did that. So to end with, potential and kinetic energy. You know what? Actually, I'm not going to be getting to my questions this time, but pull them out. I'll give you some credit for being here. One, because you deserve it, and two, I want to check a few people's IDs. <laughs> so I'm logging into Responseware to get a session ID number. So there's a session ID number. There, it's open. Once you, once you uh, the first first one, maybe I'll ask another question. Go ahead, answer anything, <laughs> and I'll register you. There's two uh, main types of energy: potential energy and kinetic energy. Uh, the book describes them really well. The first one uh, has to do with location, to change someone's energy, to to dislocate it, to move it around. It's based on position. That's potential energy. 
potential energy. So it's energy associated with the, where it's at, location. The other one is when you do work on something, not only can you move it, you can make it change speed, its velocity, affect its motion. And so the energy associated with motion is kinetic energy, kinetic energy. So we have potential energy and kinetic energy. One's associated with motion and one's associated with position. And this is my classic example. So, oh, who wants to help? You just get to let it go and hopefully not hit the signer. So I'll stand over here. Who? All right. So what we're going to ask him to do is stand, let's see, here. Hold it with your hands on this side. Right up to your eyeballs like this. And we're going to have you let it go. Let's see what happens. Not yet. Right up to your eyes. It shouldn't hit you. <laughs> I'll be here just in case. All right, when you're ready, right against your eye and then hold still. Go. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you for being brave. Most people, have you ever done that before? We're done. Most people flinch. And I'd be surprised if you didn't. And you flinch because, well, it's a reaction. But what I'm going to emphasize is energy is conserved. We gave this a certain amount of energy. I exert a force on this to lift it up vertically to this height. So we could figure out the change in energy. If, if as a reference point at this height, we say this is zero. It has zero potential energy. Well, I'm going to lift it up. Bring it over here. Well, it now has potential energy. It has potential to do work, right? When, when he lets go of it, it's going to start moving. How much potential energy does it have right now? How does that compare to the work I just did? It's the same. See, energy is conserved. The, the FD I just exerted is now in the form of potential energy. I'll give you the equations next time, but they're in your book. Well, right now it's all potential. When he let go of it, what's it turn into? Kinetic, of motion. And at this point, it's moving and still has height. So what two forms of energy does it have? Potential and kinetic. The potential's less because it's not as high. It's given up some, right? But it's now in what form that it gave up? <coughs> kinetic. So now it has the speed. When it gets to this point, and it's still moving, what's its potential energy? Zero. So it's all in what form? Kinetic. That the total is the same. Then, a little less kinetic, but more potential. And back over here, as much potential as it had over there. And back we go. And so, it's not going to magically gain more energy and whack him in the face. And in reality, it came back a little less, didn't it? Okay, you, re you ready, Brian? I'm going to do it again. Watch how closely it comes back. I'll try not to move. <laughs> right there, about here. We lost a little bit of distance. Where did that energy go? What? Disappeared? Wrong. <laughs> There's air resistance, so the air exerted a force over a distance for a little bit and converted to heat. Is it now thermal energy? Thermal energy. There's friction up there, force on the uh, rubbing. And so a little bit of our potential and kinetic energy got converted into thermal energy and is no longer part of our system. But if we counted this potential and it's, and it's kinetic plus the thermal, the total is still the same. I'll leave you with that. See you Wednesday.